Hey everybody and welcome to Death By, where contestants will earn reps for their arguments or fear elimination. I'm your host, Lauren Khalil. Whoever I decide has the best argument through the final round will stand on top of the podium and earn 30 seconds to talk about a topic of their choosing. With semifinals recently wrapping up, we have a lot of topics to cover over the next several weeks. And to begin those conversations on today's episode, we have two-time Affiliate Cup champion and seminar staff head trainer, James Hobart. CrossFit Games reporter, Nikki Brazer with Kettlebells and Cocktails. Affiliate owner and CrossFit analyst, Chase Ingram with Get With The Programming. And games athlete, Tim Paulson with Team CrossFit East Nashville proven. Let's play Death By. For the last several years, the men's European field has been run by a handful of games vets and at the top, BKG, also known as King Beaks. But after semifinals, two-time games athlete Lazar Jukic rose to the top of the leaderboard with some young blood right behind him and even the rookie, Yellow Hosta in the mix. So has the power shifted in the European men's field? And if so, who's the most interesting athlete? We have 30 seconds on the clock. James, let's start with you. Oh, good. I'm glad you picked me because like I said, I was I watched the early semifinals of oh, the clock is going. Um, Yellow Hosta, I think is uh, <laughs> the most exciting athlete to watch. He set some event records. He won three events there i don't think the power is shifting yet because i still think nine out of the uh top 10 have been to the games before um even if one of them i think was a 2019 country winner not that this discredits it but i know sometimes oh that was the point after the clock was over uh, i know sometimes people look down on that <laughs> Tim, i don't remember that noise. I that noise i was like i was like the, the clock already went but it was you giving me a point that's okay. It's been a couple of weeks. We got to get used to this again, apparently. <laughs> Tim, you've competed against some of these athletes. Um, what are your thoughts on the power shift in Europe? Uh, I would say the power is shifting, not shifted. Um, I think the games, you know, guys like BKG and Yona still have standout performances. Lazar was super impressive last year, and he's been really impressive at semifinals the last two years. So he's definitely on the rise, and I think probably – maybe the favorite European going into the games this year. Um, but, you know, BKG, Yona, those guys experience at the biggest stage and they've got the skill set to excel at that stage. So I think, like I said, Lazar is contending for the crown of Europe, but I don't think he's quite there yet. Mm. Nikki, thoughts on the men in Europe? Yeah, I don't think the power has shifted, honestly. I think when you look at a seasoned competitor like BKG, he knows when he has to peak and he knows what he has to do to compete. He doesn't need to win. So I don't necessarily think his ranking is saying one way or another whether or not he's handing off the baton of power, so to speak. I have in my notes that two of the top 10 didn't make it to the games previously, but that leaves eight, maybe nine athletes who have been there. I mean, Yona has been there friggin' eight times. So I don't think there's any real shift of power yet all right chase do you fall on the other side or are you gonna agree with the other contestants today i like what tim said is that the power is shifting but not shifted you can't count out bkg a decade straight of the games multiple top five finishes i think six in his career of the nine on the podium twice like you have to prove it at the crossfit game not just at semifinals and lazar's off season has not been very good this is his first full healthy competition which he shined one by 42 points but until you prove it at the games for multiple years on end it's not shifted yet Mm, okay, mm. we'll have to see what happens at the CrossFit Games. At the end of round one, we have a tie with Chase and Nikki. Three points. <laughs> Tim right behind them with two. And James, a little confusion at the top of the show, only <laughs> earned you one point. I'll let you go last this round so you can have a little bit more time to think. <laughs> On to topic number two. Now we will turn to look at the women's field. I personally can't wait to see what happens with them at the games. It seems like it is anybody's year. Coming out of semifinals, you have Gemi Magawa winning Europe, Emma Carey winning the East, Alex Gazan winning the West. But overall, and maybe not even any of these athletes, the semis champs, who is the favorite on the women's side post semifinals? 
45 seconds on the clock. We will let Chase start this round. I uh, you can't discredit Laura Horvath. The, what she's done when she has been healthy in a traditional game style competitive format, she's been second twice. T is not there. Mal's not there. She is the heir apparent to take this position. At semifinals, the thing I loved about Laura the most is that she didn't care about anyone else's performances. She didn't even really worry about her own performance. But the confidence that she had and the attitude that she brought to that semifinal stage waiting for the games stage that will be in Madison come the 1st of August. So Laura Horvath, just like you would look at Justin Medeiros, who's the two-time back-to-back champ, until someone sits out there and unseats them, like I said, for Lazar at the games, it's still Laura Horvath. Mm. And I did love her attitude in every single interview. She was just like, yeah, I'm not worried about this. I don't care. I'm focused on me. Nikki, what are your thoughts? Oh man, I didn't know if you really meant favorite, like points wise, or my personal favorite, but I'm going to have to go with Annie. I have to. She is going to be making her 13th trip back to the games. That is an insane stat, like for a young sport that hasn't been around for that long. I don't think that you can discredit the fact that she has surprised herself over the last few seasons after having her daughter. And I know we talk about parent strength, we talk about mom strength, but the example that she's setting, I feel like she's really taken the momentum from shocking herself and her recovery and using that to propel herself through additional training, through kind of like taking the leaderboard in, in competitions across the season that she maybe didn't think she would do as well. In, I feel like now is her time to shine and reclaim the top of the podium. Yeah, Annie is certainly a superhuman. Tim, what are your thoughts on the women's field? Uh, I agree with Chase. I think Laura is the favorite, um, but I'm going to give my kind of top nod to Danielle Brandon because she is a highly skilled meteor. And if she manages to catch the right orbit that doesn't drag her, like, you know, kind of in her, <laughs> definitely somebody who could develop the games. Um, you know, she's highly skilled. She has all these high level skills that Boz seems to love. Her capacity is phenomenal. She's very strong. Um, and like I said, she's definitely got that factor, like that kind of just like raw athleticism that can typically excel at the games field. Um, so I think coming out of semifinals, she looked great in a really competitive nor uh, Northeast semifinal. Um, Laura's still the favorite, but I think that Danielle's probably going to be my kind of shocker for top of the podium uh, with Laura. Mm, I like that. Even some style points in there, Tim, really using the nice analogies. <laughs> okay, James, end of the round. You got 45 seconds on the clock. Who is your women's favorite? I'm just going to be like a meteor that crashes into the planet. Um, I think my favorite is, 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 Laura, is Laura for sure. I think it's really hard to discount the amount of games experience. And I'd say Annie's probably a close second. The games experience that both of these athletes have. Um, I think in the last six years, Annie's been in the top five, all of them. Um, Laura obviously has a second, a third, as well as a second. And I think as cool of semifinals was as a test, I think it's hard to look at it as a complete test. And I think athletes like Laura and like Annie will only start to do better the more tests that gets tacked on. So something outside of that traditional uh, seven. I'm also a really big fan of the younger athletes like Emma Lawson, who has continually done better and placed six last year and hopefully will get closer to that podium this year. Nice. Damn. So at the end of <laughs> At the end of round two, I'm sorry, James. You tried to make a comeback, but there just wasn't enough time on the clock. Three points, you were eliminated, and then we got Tim in third with four points, Nikki in second with five, and Chase in first with six. Goodbye, James. On to topic number three. This year at semifinals, not all of the events were broadcasted on the live stream. However, to give the community some kind of coverage, thanks to Chase and some others that were involved, they were able to produce a stream using laptops and iPhones. So to put on a broadcast, we know that it's expensive. But what if the broadcast charged for the stream to offset the cost and in turn, they were able to show every event? So. Under what circumstances would you be willing to pay for a live stream for the CrossFit broadcast? And if so, what is your price? We now have one minute on the clock. Ooh, I'm going to start with Tim just because the look on his face. He's chomping at the bit over there. Yeah, so I think my 
great bar. Um, this is no shot, like kind of shot at the broadcast. The production quality is incredible, but I think we've kind of come to expect that in this day and age from sports is that we get a broadcast that we can watch that doesn't cost us money. You know, a lot of sport events are like that. But what would do it for me is like featured groups. So you see the like PGA Tour coverage, what they'll have yeah. is you can highlight a group, you can watch a certain hole, things like that. And I think if you were able to like, hey, I want to watch a certain lane so that I can watch my athlete or my team go, and I don't have to watch the leaders every single time. Um, obviously, I know why they highlight the leaders, but there's obviously a big community that follows a lot of these athletes and these teams. So if they could pay extra and be able to highlight only their team in their lane when they want to watch, I think that would go a long way for me as far as how much I would pay. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe 50 bucks for an event. I guess. I don't know. I've, yeah, 50 bucks. We'll go with 50 bucks. Ooh. Okay. So 50 bucks for the full weekend of coverage. Yeah. That sounds good to me. Okay. Chase and Nikki, you guys have both been part of the broadcast. So I'm kind of curious on what your takes are. Um, Nikki, we'll let you start with this one. Oh, man. I had a really hard time with this answer. I don't think I would be willing to pay for a live stream. I just think we've gotten so used to it being streaming for free that, and, and I'm just being super honest, like even as a fan of the sport, I'd probably just be like, okay, well, I'll just like watch some killer highlights afterwards or like some of my favorite creators will probably be streaming or posting some video somewhere that I can watch. And it's tough because we really want CrossFit to feel like a greater endemic sport, right? And like a lot of those sports have networks that you have to pay for. And so like charging for the broadcast really does put us in line with a lot of those other sports and I fully understand that but I really believe in using CrossFit the sport as a marketing tool to get people into the affiliates like boots on the ground using inspirational fitness to get people to help themselves on a daily basis in their everyday lives and so in that respect I think that the broadcast should be as accessible as possible to as many people as possible and we should recoup and find the funds elsewhere. Tim right now is at 50 bucks for the weekend. Nikki is at zero. Chase, where do you land in this conversation? <laughs> right smack dab in the middle. And I think uh, <laughs> what, you sh what we, we saw at semifinals was that you can produce an alternative stream to what the broadcast is doing. The broadcast, in my opinion, should always be free and should always be high quality. If you're going to charge for something different, it should be different. So like Tim said, being able to pick a lane you can watch. Another one is a wide coverage screen. And these two things, I think not only will be important to evolving the sport going forward and bringing in new audiences, but making sure that you can actually post produce something for coaches and athletes, just like you see in other sports when they look at film. So I would like to purchase the wide screen format for event six or my athlete's lane who is in lane seven and giving these access post produ produ produced to coaches is another thing. And also having a different, maybe commentary for those, these alternative streams for other viewers as well. So I say, yes, $20 a day per event. <laughs> Ooh, a day per event. That's going to get more pricey than what Tim's 50 bucks was going to give us. Well, a a three day competition, <laughs> 50 bucks. If you argument. want to watch me too. Yeah. 20 bucks. Okay. A day. So realistically, how far away do you think we are from doing that? Well, after maybe what I personally experience across semifinals, I think we're f closer than we are further. Um, it would still, really? I mean, like you said, we shot it on a laptop and cell phones. Like, it's like, what is, what potato is this being shot on? I was like, my shitty iPhone 10 <laughs> on a 5G network because we can't connect to the Wi Fi, right? And so I, I, I don't think, know. I feel like lead time, it's, it's doable, but it, it is not as easy as people may think it could be. Yeah, I think really close to doable, but not very close to organized and able to take payments and able to figure out exactly what the thing, I think we can shotgun shoot things quickly. The technology is there. We're all very capable people. We can even bring in more capable people. But I feel like organizing something that can be like purchased that has, that I just, it takes so long to put something like that together. So I feel like that element is further, further away. No, it's already been done. Flow Elite already does it. It's, I mean, oh, so we it's can just hire them. To come in and do that. Got it. <laughs> but it's, you're saying like, it, it's like, it's already done. Like we know how to do it. We just have to get the right people in place to put it in place, but it's not like we have to make up or reinvent anything. We just got to apply. Totally agree. Like. 
better. Yeah, we'll better totally agree with that. I just think that putting those people in place for, I just, I don't want it to take as long as it does to organize and coordinate that kind of stuff, but I know that it does, unfortunately. Or honestly, it's probably who knows what kind of market interest there really is for that. You know, like a lot of people who are really fired up on one athlete, one team, probably go to a semifinal to watch them or most of them do. So who knows what kind of actual bearable market there would be. I mean, CrossFit may end up just losing money on the endeavor. And like, I don't really encourage CrossFit to, to lose more money. I think that's uh, not a not a winning endeavor. Yeah. I'd also like Lots to point out that Chase got for making my argument again. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, Tim, I think for this time, he just made your argument better. I just started taking oh, on something. Neanderthal. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, unfortunately, Tim, you're eliminated. <laughs> Five points for you. Right above you, we got Nikki with six. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> and then Chase oh, leading the way with eight. Yeah. Checking his He's notes. just like, okay, I'm done with you guys. <laughs> Get him out of here. Now we will start topic number four. We're continuing with the theme of semifinals. So speaking to the programming, we saw a lot of machine work. Assault air runners in three out of the seven scored tests and machines as a whole in five of the seven tests. Throughout the years, CrossFit competitions have seen inconsistencies of machines, whether the calibration was incorrect or the machine just didn't turn on. Ultimately, every time there's a machine work, there's room for error, but machines or monostructural work is a third of CrossFit. So what is the balance of having machine work in live competition? Chase, we'll start with you. One minute on the clock. So if you look at modalities, as you said, like a third of the, mo like if you'd said it's monostructural weightlifting gymnastics, yes, it's one of the three, but it's not necessarily, it should be exactly 33.3% of the things that are programmed. The danger with programming machines is like you said, Lauren, is that calibration is part of it. Now, if it's just one or two events, it's negligible. But when you say it's five to seven, it just opens the door up for more issues. And one of the other things that we saw with the machines is that the machines are very biased to basically someone's body type and body size. Bigger, stronger athletes manage these machines better. But just like we see in gymnastics on the flip side is shorter, smaller athletes have an advantage there. The key is, is there a balance between those within each other? And not just the percentage of the work being programmed, but how much of an impact those individual movements have on the events. So just because maybe there's five to seven, if they're a low impact machine to the actual test itself, not that big of a deal. If it does the whole thing like test one, much different story. Yeah. Nikki, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I see where Chase is coming from with that. And I don't disagree, but I do think that if you look at it from a purely percentage perspective, where it really is a third of what we did at semis and it is a third of what we do in CrossFit, it feels very appropriate for this stage of testing. I mean, the reality is that machines are a part of our testing protocol in CrossFit for capacity and for conditioning. And I do think that they have a place in the competition. I think that people get upset when it comes to issues like calibration or one machine just, I don't know, like dipped out, did something poorly when another one didn't. And the reality is we do have teams that come in and try to test them and try to find fail safes and try to make sure that things are going right. But there's always going to be room for error. But I think in sport, there's going to be room for error outside of just machines too. If they were running outside versus running on a machine, people would complain about the courses or, you know, someone rolled their ankle and stepped somewhere. I mean, we had people miscount laps on the bike. I also think that people like to complain about machines because because they're a little bit more boring to watch, but that's like a whole nother argument in and of itself, but I think they've been used appropriately this far. Okay, that is a completely different conversation. You ain't lying. <laughs> At the end of round four, we have Nikki with nine points, Chase with 10. We are headed into the final round where we will then crown our podium pedestal winner. Here we go. Topic number five. At the North America East semifinal, CrossFit ultimately pulled Alex Carone out from competition due to an injury that he was dealing with for not completing any of the ring muscle up complex, although there was not a minimum work requirement. In North America West, CrossFit Invictus athlete Jorge Fernandez was dealing with an injury and sat out of the clean ladder, but his teammate Joshua El Chama was able to complete. Therefore, 
CrossFit did not withdraw them. So where is the line between professional and problematic when it comes to withdrawing athletes from competition? Chase, I'll let you start one minute on the clock here. I think the line starts with actually drawing a hard line. And where the problem is, is that we had a lot of gray in semifinals. And some of that was a product of situations that were brought up to them for the first time and them having to make decisions on the fly. When you look at this, it's two different ways to see it. You see it from the athlete's perspective in other sports is like, I will do whatever it takes to stay out on here, whether it's, you know, limp through this or back out of it entirely. I think what CrossFit needs to do now that they've experienced this is set hard black and white lines. The problem is the gray. And assessing situations as they come up in real time is not the way to do it, right? So putting something in place that will have that. I don't think anybody could objectively sit back and say that CrossFit maybe made the wrong decision with removing, say, Corone from competition. It was the process of which he was brought that he could compete depending on what it was. So drawing hard lines between professional and problematic, I think that's where CrossFit needs to focus their attention on. Mm. Nikki, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, honestly, I'm sorry to piggyback off Chase, but I had a very similar answer. I don't necessarily think that there's an issue saying that you know you must complete x amount of work or you must continue to put an effort throughout the entire event in order to you know kind of prevent sandbagging and make sure that people aren't more or less rested and recovered for additional events coming up i think the problem is that that gray area didn't leave a lot of or left rather too much room for interpretation for the athletes and i think in a few cases including with corona i wasn't there but i had heard that he was kind of like asking in the moment he was like okay i kind of tried to do one do i need to keep trying to do one am i still good you know do i need to show some kind of effort what exactly do i need to do in order to continue competing. And I don't think that he got a great answer or maybe the answer that he got wasn't the right one and they had to decide later on, but kind of like figuring it out on the fly isn't the way to do it. So I don't necessarily think that the rule is wrong. I think that they need to figure out how to really draw a hard line in the sand so that the athletes are super aware and the coaches are super aware because they're going to make that decision together. Mm. That is what we all want to see is just let us know the rules for the coaches, the athletes, the spectators, et cetera. At the end of round five, it was a close one for our comeback journey. The first one back after semifinals, Nikki with 11, Chase by the skin of his teeth, got 12. He will advance to the podium pedestal. 30 seconds, Chase, what you wanna talk about today? Oh, revamping the, or revisiting the strength of field in the worldwide Ooh. ranking system. Yes, I would like to, I would like to take a second look at this when we look at, say, the top 100. And, and it came into discussion is using the worldwide ranking system to dedicate the strength of field for the semifinals. But we did use athletes that did not compete in competition in that ranking system, whether they were no longer competing or they went team. And I think revisiting that and then using the strength of field, not just how many numbered of athletes did you have in the top 100, but how good those athletes actually are within the top 100. So I think a little revisit of the strength of field using some smarter people than me, which is why I can ask for it and not do it myself, <laughs> would be uh, something I'd be very curious about. So if any of those smart people are listening right now, come on in and help us out. Uh, it looks like Tim really did <laughs> dip out. He had dad duty or something in his car. <laughs> but James, Nikki, Chase, Tim, wherever you are in TV land, thank you everybody for joining us for another episode of Death By. We are now back until we head to Madison for the CrossFit Games. As I mentioned at the top of the show, we have a ton of topics that we want to dive into. Semi-final specific and then of course athlete specific. Make sure if you haven't yet to like and subscribe our Instagram and YouTube channel. You can find all of us on there. We have um, our studio shows. We also recently did an interview with Ben Bergeron after he made his big announcement stepping away from the head coach at CompTrain. That's where you can find it on our YouTube channel. And until next time, from all of us at Talking Elite Fitness, I'm Lauren Khalil, and we'll see you next time.